Good afternoon, everyone, and evening and morning, wherever we are in the world. I'm Deb Willis, and I am happy to be here to welcome all of you to this moment. Um, we know around the world, globally, we are having an experience. I'm thinking about what's going on um, about injustices. We are pleased that you have taken time to be here with all of our speakers to share our stories about this experience of women and migrations, but also what's going on today. I'd like to introduce our Senior Vice President for Global Inclusion and Strategic Innovation and Chief Diversity Officer, Lisa Coleman, who will also welcome you. Thank you. Echoing, thank you, Deb, echoing your sentiments. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to everyone, of course, who's working on this. I'd like to just first say thank you to everyone who's working behind the scenes across the world to keep us all healthy and well, whether you're in the front lines or working as delivery services or whatever we're doing. We hope that everyone is continuing to take good care. I'd like to take a moment of silence to honor the ancestors who paved the way for us to be here in whatever spaces we are located, as well as to acknowledge the lands upon which we sit and occupy. Thank you so much for that moment of silence and recognition. I would also like to just also thank uh, our partners. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, of course, to the incredible Deb Willis and all of the work that you are doing, have done, continue to do. Ellen, Cheryl, Tom, uh, thank you to the IAA, to Tish, the 370J uh, project, uh, to Spelman's A AUC Art Collective for partnering with us uh, on this discussion. I know that uh, we all, you know that some of us were supposed to be traveling. I know there was a trip to Greece. I do look forward to the time when we'll all be able to gather together in person again. I hope that everyone is continuing to take care and stay well. Thank you again. We know that uh, today, and we're addressing these relevant questions about COVID-19 and the current moment and the current pandemic crisis. We've seen, as Deb mentioned, an escalation of a number of things, including racism, violence, xenophobia, social inequities, and the disparities that disproportionately impact marginalized and historically uh, marginalized and disenfranchised communities, and in particular, members of our uh, communities of Black Black members of our communities, as well as people of African descent. These are difficult times, and I want to say uh, publicly, thank you, Deb, for your letter to the community, and thank you to all the people who've been working so hard to make sure that members of our disenfranchised communities are being served. Though our, through our, work, though our work has always been crucial, we are now, of course, more uh, aware more than ever of the urgency of the work to think about um, the work that you all are doing in terms of women and migrations, uh, those, as I've already said, who have been disenfranchised historically. Everyone keeps saying that this is our new normal, and I keep saying this is not normal at all. Um, the question will be, what will our new normal look like? And hopefully our new normal will not look like our past. Hopefully our new normal, we will be able to pave and find new pathways to exist where we will be able to serve members of our marginalized communities better. And the ways in which we code and recode violence and terrorism will actually take into account those powerful entities that direct power and violence against those who are disenfranchised. Today's program is in partnership with the office that I had. Thank you so much. And it's also part of our year long initiative focusing on the contribution of women. We have an ongoing initiative this year, which is called NYU Women 100. And this effort is to situate and commemorate uh, of, uh, the ratification of the 19th Amendment here in the United States, but also to, um, and what we're doing in particular here at NYU is to honor and to recognize those who were uh, actually not part of that discussion in uh, the 1920s and who were systematically actually excluded. So we are focusing on women of color, members of our LGBTQ plus and trans communities, as well as our non-binary binary communities. So you can imagine that I'm thrilled and very much looking forward to the rich discussion today. 
um, and that we are very much looking forward to thinking about how people are gendered globally, what that means in terms of historical moments, how we think about war and persecution and security for women and how we how women have been displaced, made captive, trafficked, enslaved. And even in this time of the COVID-19 pandemic, we know that women are being disproportionately impacted as well. Thank you so much again to all of our panelists for taking time and all of the participants. I want to just say here again that in the office, we continue to um, do the work to address these issues of social conflict and, of course, our work in solidarity with people who are addressing issues of racism um, in this intersectional context today. We, I want to say again, and some of you have heard me say this over and over again, uh, women of color, people of color, women, uh, sometimes we, uh, the normal or uh, we, are, we get defined as the problem. And I want to say over and over again, when I wake up and look in the mirror, and certainly when I look at people like Deb and Cheryl and others, not only are we not the problem, we're the solution. We are, right? We are the solution to so much that ails society today. So thank you. I'm looking forward to this discussion. I wish I could stay for the entire discussion, but I'm also looking forward to being the moderator next week. And congratulations to everyone in advance. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. I'd like to introduce my colleague, Ellen Tostano, who will introduce the program and give a brief history. And also acknowledge Ford Foundation for supporting us, as well as we have closed caption um, available for those um, who would like to have um, to read the, uh, the transcription. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Deb. Thank you, Lisa, for um, important opening words. Um, I'm going to try to situate these four talks in uh, the series of um, talks that have been convened by the Women in Migrations Working Group, which is an interdisciplinary project founded in June of 2017 in Florence, Italy. The following summer, we pu published an edited uh, volume of the first proceeding, the, a compilation of the contributions of 42 women scholars, authors, and artists. And I think we're posting a link to that uh, book in the chat. Um, we then traveled to Abu Dhabi in 2019. Uh, at the beginning of this year, Dr. Willis curated an important exhibition at the Maryland Institute College of Art in um, MICA, including the work of some of the artists um, who will be with us through this series. There's a link to that exhibition also in the chat. We anticipated convenings um, in March of this year in DC and in Athens in these days. Needless to say, neither was possible. But thanks to the cooperation of our, all of our community and the support of so many, some of whom have already been mentioned, but also including NYU uh, DC, the Bradamus Center, and NYU's Office of Global Inclusion, Diversity, and Strategic Innovation, and as Deb said, the Ford Foundation, we, like everybody else, have adapted to Zoom. The goal of the working group is to examine the role that photography, art, film, history, and literature have played in identifying and remembering the migratory experiences of women globally. We seek to capture the breadth of experience in the movement of women and cultures. We include diasporas, international displacements, international and transnational migrations, the movements of people because of climate change, geopolitical instabilities, authoritarianism, and the pressures of globalization. Women pressed into motion by crisis, to be sure, but also circumstances of kinship, community, collaboration, and opportunity. We add these perspectives to a substantial literature on migration in sociology, anthropology, philosophy, public policy and law. And we wonder that if we broaden and expand the language of migration through a multitude of voices telling stories, if we make the voices of women more audible and give space to women to narrativize their own inner lives in the context of the historic displacements of people, can we reverse the toxicity of the public debate? And in the words of Representative Jayapal create a 
quote, new moral imagination of immigration. The public policy lens through which migration is analyzed is one vantage point, an essential one to be sure. Immigration has become one of the most contested issues of political debate throughout the world. But we hope that the critical engagement of artists and writers with the political discourse of immigration will help us to understand the lived experiences of home and loss, longing and the desire to return, family and belonging, isolation, identity and borders. Borders as political delimitators, but also between invisibility and visibility. Issues salient both in the experience of migration and in the epical times in which we find ourselves today. These are stories of trauma and fear and righteous anger, but also stories of strength, perseverance, joy, and hope of women surviving their own moments of disorientation and dislocation. So we begin today with a general discussion of the issues of women and migrations. On June 10th, there's, there's a parade of horns going by me right now. On June 10th, we will look at uh, the context of crises, COVID and otherwise. On June 17, we examine the experiences of women through memoir, and on June 24th, through art. We hope that our wide lens will open the space of reflection and commitment. Some logistical notes. We will leave time at the end of the presentations, all of the presentations, hopefully the last half hour for questions. We invite you to submit questions as they occur to you in the Q&A section um, and not the chat. If you have a question for a particular panelist, please note which. And as Deb pointed out, the conversation will be closed captioned and recorded. Thank you. And Maza. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Deb. It's really wonderful. Um, I don't know if it's a pleasure to be here. It's just necessary. Um, I am going to read a part of uh, my, my essay that is in the book, uh, Women and Migration. And I am also uh, going to put up here, so on a shared screen, my PowerPoint that has two images and hopefully you can see them once I uh, share the screen. She reclines on a rock, propped on her elbow, squinting into the sun. A valley unfolds in wide easy sweeps over her bare shoulders. That she is naked from the waist up is an uncomfortable detail but not unusual. This is Ethiopia. And this is 1937, and you know the larger history that frames this photograph. You know the larger history that frames this photograph, a familiar story involving words like invasion and war and Europe and colonialism. What you notice instead is the tiny cross that hangs around her neck and the rings that adorn four fingers of one hand. Her short curls are padded into a perfect bloom. She looks to be at the start of a smile. The set of her mouth suggests it, as if she were snapped in the middle of an easy exchange with the photographer. Slivers of paper pasted onto the photo offer an Italianized spelling of her name and the town. At the bottom in florid handwriting is the date, 1937. She is the first photo in an album once owned by an Italian soldier a member of the fascist army that invaded Ethiopia in 1935. The war ended in 1936 and Italy declared victory. This photo was taken a year into the Italian occupation of the country. On its own, it carries no real weight. It is exploitative, but relatively benign, not as bad as some. You turn the page and the next and the next, and what stares back is a series of women, mostly Ethiopian, nearly all of them bare chested, many completely naked. At first you are simply taken aback by the careful arrangement of the album. It is curated, photos organized and meticulously labeled, guided by a patient hand. 
Many photographs include a label with the subject's name. The cities indicated form a zigzag across Ethiopia. At times, as if it is unacceptable to leave a photo unmarked, a label simply announces the subject as Donna Abyssina, Abyssinian woman. This designation sheds light on the growing unease you have felt creeping in since you turned the first page of the album, and it solidifies when you pause to consider what is in front of you. Some of those deemed women are simply girls, their youth obscene in this context. The full horror sets in and builds, and you have to shut the album and put it away. Um, I'm going to leave this here. Every, I can't hear myself. Everyone, I'm fine with the volume. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to talk through this for a couple of minutes now. I had this album, and as I mentioned, there were the album was full of women um, and girls in various states of undress. And the the first time that I saw this, I looked through it and and shut it quickly. Um, continued my research on my novel, which is set in 1935 during the Italian invasion of Ethiopia and the war that resulted. And maybe a couple of years after I got this album and it had been sitting in a drawer for a while, um, it was purely because we were having a Black Portraitures conference and Deb said, you need to write about this, that I got this album out again and it was also by coincidence that in looking through the dates here, um, it rang a bell. And then I looked at the locations and, and some alarm signals started going off. So I got a map and started putting these locations on, um, on a map of Ethiopia because what, was, what I was hearing were echoes of a different kind of migration. Um, and these were based on testimonials of survivors of execution camps and concentration camps that the Italians had set up across Ethiopia. Camps in places like Shano, which is where this photograph was taken, and Dabra Sinna, which is where another set of photographs were taken, and Dabra Brahan, which is where another set of photographs were taken, and Dase, which is where another photograph was taken. And I started thinking, um, I became overwhelmed actually of the, about the fact that these women were photographed by this particular photographer in the same places where execution sites were taken. And what this man was doing was not photographing the violence that's actually happening just over the so shoulder of this woman, but taking the woman herself and the body becoming a camouflage for a violence that's happening just down that hill. Um, I started thinking about the ways that the, my imagination migrates to those acts of violence that are acceptable in order to hide the other acts of violence that are not acceptable, that that man does not want to reflect him. Um, I'm going to go now to the next photograph that I have here. And this was taken in a town called Dabra Brahan, but the Italians misspelled it. And um, this is a photo towards the end of the album, and it's a woman named Bogalic from Dabra Brahan. And unlike the others, she is fully clothed in her traditional Ethiopian dress. She has a shawl draped across one shoulder and stands with her chin raised, a rifle in her hand. The muzzle is pointed up as if it is aimed at the sky. She is not afraid, nor is she demure. She looks determined and resilient, strong. She is a startling vision to come across in an album such as this. It would be easy to look at this picture and praise it for its positive portrayal of an African woman. It's easy, you know, taken on its own and might even symbolize the photographer's leanings toward a more complex understanding of women. 
but in an, but in an album otherwise full of half clothed or naked subjects, the photo of a woman with a gun becomes not a sign of male, of female strength, but a mockery of it. Her implied weakness is exposed by all the other pictures that came before her. She is bound by their fate. And I've often wondered um, about this woman and who she was. And initially I had a reaction, my initial reaction looking at this is, this is a woman, oh, I'm, time is up. Um, I will leave it at that, that this woman is bound by the fate of everything else that came before her. The end, thank you. Thank you, Maza. Uh, of course, there's, I could listen forever. <laughs> and I'm sure everyone else will and definitely will buy and, and be able to order the book online. Um, uh, we will talk about it during the um, Q&A. Cheryl Finley will definitely um, present that. It's, it's a breathless IFRA. Um, thank you so much to the amazing women that organized this space for all of us. Um, it's an honor to share this virtual experience with all of you. Uh, special thanks to Dr. Dr. Deborah Willis, who in a short time become one of my favorite people at NYU and I call her a gift to all of us. So thank you, Dr. Deborah Willis for including me um, in this wonderful gathering of, of women to talk about women and migration. Um, my name is Ifrah Magan. I am a um, Somali refugee, um, came to the United States about 20 years ago with my family. Um, I wanted to briefly today just share a poem that I wrote uh, several years ago describing the complexities associated with forced migration, uh, the narrative of forced migration. But before I do that, and I'll just give a brief remarks before the poem and, and leave you all with the poem. Um, before I begin talking about displacement, displacement for me as a personal experience, but also um, I research and work with refugee communities here in the United States. I want to note first and foremost the um, history of violence, colonization um, that we all as refugees come into when we arrive here in the United States of America. We're all in a settler colony. We're talking about women and migrations today and I want to also acknowledge the First Nation indigenous women um, black women, African American women that built this country, black people that built this country that did not have the, you know, oftentimes when people say this is a land of immigrants, that sort of erases that history as well, the history of indigenous people and of black people. And so as a black Muslim woman, I want to first and foremost acknowledge that history um, and, and situate this conversation in this poem um, for all of us in, in, you know, and have that as a backdrop. So I'll share my poem. It's entitled Refugees. Bismillah. Refugees without lands, no longer a place to call home. Ocean waters calling, but shores afraid to receive us. Refugees because borders define citizenship. Humans don't just settle in this world unless they destroy your home. Refugees, blue skies and full moons we gaze upon, wondering when we can finally feel the breeze. Breeze and ease waiting for some peace of mind. Waiting to accept and be accepted by others we'd never met. Waiting, we do a lot of waiting and thinking until thoughts turn into dreams. Dreams we dream to stay alive, to stay hopeful and faithful. Faithful we are to our deen, to our Lord who sees us even when we can no longer see ourselves. Our own heart aches, soul drifts away to a land where only angels live. We remain alive listening to the stories of a land we don't remember, but yet our memory encapsulates every pavement we've missed to touch. Our memory tries to hold on to memories never made, 
of a past without pathways to futures unknown and presents wrapped like gifts never opened. But every time I search, I find this land so strange, yet so close to me. I hear the words of my father as he prayed in early hours before dawn. I hear the tears of my mother as she wonders how we will make home of a land so foreign, so far away from the place she calls home. Home was her birthplace and places she found familiar faces. She belonged, felt belonged to. Home was the pieces made together with my father. She now wonders what happens to the pieces shattered by pain and diasporic tales of being a black Muslim mother to black Muslim children in a land where their identities serve threats to national security. A land where she found peace yet difficult to embrace as home because home is a place where she's embraced without question, where she can speak in her eloquent speech, trilingual, but her intelligence reduced by mere fact that she doesn't speak the language of this land. English is expected to be spoken, but English is never expected to be traded for languages called foreign. But what if the foreign is familiar and the familiar is foreign? What if we never negotiate with deals not made by us? What if we let go of things not meant for us? What if we define our truth to counter every, every lie against us? What if we come together as family in a land unfamiliar to us, but in hopes of making it our home? Our home is every place we built bricks made out of strength and survival and patience. Our home is every place we encountered beautiful souls, people so different than us, but we feel like we've known. Our home is always with us deep down in our souls because we are the bricks needed and God is the reason why we still stand tall. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I feel like we're sitting at our dining room table and we are sharing these uh, beautiful moments and I feel your mother and, and the poem, it's, it's just um, this beautiful. Uh, we will um, have Sade um, present, and here we are, Sade. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for bringing me on to this panel, Deb and Ellen and Cheryl. Um, okay, I'm going to just go ahead and start. Um, a light sculpture that I created uh, in 2018 called Avarash, which means you give light. It's named after my aunt, um, one of my mom's oldest living sisters right now in Addis Ababa. Um, and as you can see, it is um, a mirror light sculpture with Ethiopian Coptic crosses um, on the faces. And the reason why I use those um, is because um, their long time meaning of um, being used as a form of protection and healing in Christianity, but also um, during the pre-Christian era in, in the East African region. Um, each, there's li 10 light boxes that are stacked on top of each other, so it's a 10 foot tall light sculpture, and each one is named after a different black woman, girl, um, and black trans woman who has died, you know, who's died from state sanctioned violence um, here in the U.S. and also has died um, in the journey from East Africa to Libya um, through the Mediterranean into Europe. Um, and also, um, just to give you background, all the names and stories I pulled from the Say Her Name document um, that Kimberly Crenshaw is behind, um, United Intercultural Action, um, which is a European nonprofit, and the Human Rights Campaign that um, has been tracking the deaths of trans people in this country. Um, and we did a performance to activate the sculpture, but also to embody um, these black women and, um, and girls. And um, as you can see, there's the word ship that's taped on our foreheads that is uh, pulled from Christina Sharp's In the Wake. There's an image of a Haitian girl with the word ship um, taped on her forehead um, from the 2010 Haitian earthquake. Um, and here's an image of me. Um, in front of the light sculpture. The dress that I'm wearing has uh, mirror pieces that are the negative space from the light sculpture attached to the dress. Um, this is a larger installation um, that I did last year. It's called Sunlight and Nahum. 
it's uh, named after Sun Knight, who was a part of my original 10 light sculptures. Um, Sun Knight is, was a 19 year old woman, woman, Eritrean woman who died in a German detention center. She took the life of her six month old child and then committed suicide. And the reason why that really resonated with me is because I am a mother and it also reminded me of uh, Margaret Garner who um, was a black woman here um, who killed her daughter um, in the attempts of basically keeping her away from slavery. Um, so I see strength in both of what, both of what they did for their child um, as a mother. And the, name, the meaning of their names, which is really important to my work is Sun Knights means the comforter. Uh, I'm sorry, the peacemaker and Naho means the comforter. Um, so the guides that come with these light sculptures that we then activate in performance is reading out the, the, the names of all these women and the meaning of their names. Um, this is a detailed shot. Um, okay, um, this is the Astral Sea. Um, I have two versions of these. I'm working on my third one right now for um, 100 Women in 100 Years exhibit at Park Armory that also, Deb also is organizing and pulled me into with NYU. And um, this first iteration has, again, the negative space from the light sculptures, which is another layer um, meaning, of meaning to the work. Um, for me, this is, again, by wearing these pieces, I'm embodying the, these women, and I'm, I am actively asking them to come through me um, in this work. Um, this is a image of a performance I did with Cecily Boombre um, during my solo show um, where I made the 50 light boxes that ended up being eight towers in the installation. And she is singing the names of the 50 women that this work is based off of and the meaning of their names while I'm performing with the Astral Sea. Um, and I'm bringing it to last year when I went to the Venice Biennale in May for the opening week. And then I went again for the closing weekend in November. This was for the opening week. I performed in front of a migrant boat that was put on display by the Venice Biennale, as well as Christophe Bouchel, who was the artist that brought the boat. Um, and he called the boat Batka Nostra, meaning our boat. Um, I, I did this intervention twice um, as a protest to putting black de death on display and the Biennale did not respond too kindly to it. Um, this, during this image, um, there is footage for, for this performance. Um, I was playing Bachata Nera, which is a Italian fascist song that is still alive and well in, in Italy. Um, Igiabo Schiavo, a Somalian Italian scholar, um, described it best as the carnal union between Italian soldiers and little Ethiopian girls because the song was created during the Mussolini era um, when Italy was waging war in Ethiopia. And um, I went back um, in November 2019 with Dagmawi Yemid, who is an Ethiopian Italian uh, filmmaker who um, is dear friends with Maaza. He texted me yesterday when I told him I was going to be on here. Um, he is a documentary filmmaker who did the trek from Ethiopia through Libya, through the Mediterranean in 2005, um, and has now dedicated, dedicated his entire practice to documenting the lives of African migrants in Europe. And uh, we went back in November. I gave the Biennale a heads up that I was coming, and I personally contacted Ralph Rugoff. Um, I wasn't asking their permission. I was just letting them know that I was planning on coming back to pay my respects to the to the up to 1,200 Black migrants who died, not entirely all Black, um, but mostly of African descent who died on this boat um, because this boat was put on display as an object and I thought that was disgusting. And um, it was also placed across from a cafe in Arsenale. Um, so when you would walk by the boat, you just would watch people sitting, drinking and eating. Um, during the opening week, there's a lot of, you can Google this, there's a bunch of people who took selfies with the boat. Um, and as you can see here, um, both times I was uh, stopped by the police, as well as the first time they racially profiled people who were in the audience. Um, I'm just going to play this. Already. Already. Okay. 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 
because I sold the big call soon. They're saying you know, but you, you care about this as an art piece. That's what you're protecting. You're protecting this as artwork as an object. I'm of Ethiopian descent. I'm a black person, and I'm here to memorialize the black people who died on this boat. Um, okay, and yeah, so um, basically, like most black, if not all black people, I'm tired of being re-traumatized, um, and this was basically the equivalent of putting a slave ship on display for people to pay 50 euros to get into, the, to just walk by it. Um, I I'm continuing this work. Um, I'm now moving my focus to the U.S.-Mexican border, and I'm going to be working with um, immigration lawyer Rebecca Alamayu and um, Guerlain, who runs the Haitian Bridge Alliance. Um, hopefully, once this the COVID situation um, clears, I will be traveling to the border. Well, once they open the border back up. Until then, I'll be visiting detention centers with them um, to basically figure out how I can support the work that they're doing because um, they are working through COVID right now. Um, and I've, there's links that um, I've shared, but Rebecca talks about how she um, is doing hearings for her clients over the phone. Um, so the situation is completely upside down, but okay. All right, that is all. Also, I just want to say, um, say Ayana Dior's name, a black trans woman who was brutally murdered. Thank you, today. heartened by this work. Um, we have Anna next. And um, following Anna, we will have, uh, Cheryl will um, introduce the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just stick around. It's always such a pleasure to be involved um, in this gathering and to work with um, people like Deb and Cheryl and. Um, Alan, thank you again so much for including me. So um, my paper, my talk today is really um, sort of fleshing out some aspects of a new project that I'm working on called the Global Plantation, <clears throat> which examines um, and focuses on the history and representations of plantations and indentured labor in Australia, South Asia and the Caribbean. Some of you may have read Amitav Ghosh's trilogy, The Sea of Poppies, but it's a beautiful rendering, I think, of the, um, the ways that indentureship connected the Atlantic, the Indian and Pacific Oceans through a system of unfree labor that continued uh, the systems of plantation management and labor extraction refined under slavery. Uh, and so, um, Today, I want to talk about two artists, one based in Sri Lanka. Can you hear me? I'm just going to take this up. Talk about two artists, one based in, Austra in Australia, one based in Sri Lanka, who are dealing with these um, legacies of indentureship, which, um, which are generally erased in the official narratives of, of Australia and, and Sri Lanka. Um, Jasmine Togo Brisby and Hanusha Somasandram. And what I want to focus on today is the way that their artwork really decenters the official narratives, um, the official public narratives, by focusing on the personal and familial stories um, that, that they have learned, um, you know, passed down from their mothers and grandmothers uh, to them. So I want to begin with uh, Jasmine's work. Jasmine Togo Brisby is a fourth generation Australian uh, South Sea Islander. She grew up in, uh, in Queensland and her practice really draws on her, on her family history. Her great, great grandparents were taken from Vanuatu as children uh, and brought to work in the sugar industry in Northwest Queensland. Um, and Australian South Sea Islanders to sort of trace their history back to this, um, the, this moment of forced transportation, which was really a form of kidnapping. It was uh, derogatory, derogatorily called blackbirding in the 19th century. And it lasted from between 1863 to 19, 1904. And it's really been ignored largely um, in Australian history. So in her, um, 
In her sculpture, Bittersweet, which she made 2015, she deals precisely with this history of erasure. Here she shows us a pile of skulls which are cast in unrefined sugar and resin. They glisten under the gallery lights and slowly give off a very sickly sweet smell. The work was prompted by the discovery of an unmarked mass grave on a former plantation in Queensland. For Jasmine, the grave is a profound metaphor of the literal, literal silencing of this history in the public sphere. But it's also a metaphor for the loss experienced by Australian South Sea Islander communities whose culture and language were stolen um, and lost when they were kidnapped and brought across this, the sea. So in this work, Jasmine's creating the space for mourning while also powerfully materializing the profound oppression and dislocation and trauma, familial trauma passed down through generations, a trauma that continues to sustain uh, the inheritance of wealth, as she calls it, created by colonialism, um, histories of colonialism and slavery embedded in the Australian sugar industry. Now, the erasure of history through its idealization uh, comes out in the work of Hanusha Samasundaram, who was a Tamil artist um, whose family were, are tea pickers in the hill country of Sri Lanka. Um, these communities were first brought to the island as indentured laborers from the state of Tamil Nadu in South India in the, late uh, in the middle of the 19th century. They were exploited, they were violated, and um, particularly the women, there was a lot of sexual violence. They labored under harsh conditions and they were held in debt from their first arrival. Because of their caste and um, their Indian ancestry, they've also been politically alienated within Sri Lanka. They're not accepted by Sri Lankan born Tamil communities of which, you know, which is what I'm from. Um, and because of these economic and political factors, hill country or up country Tamils as they're called, continue to be marginalized. They work for minimal wages while their labor is central to the nation's economy. Um, as these historical photographs and descriptions show, Tamil, Tamil tea pickers, particularly women, were often represented in ways that emphasize their exotic femininity. They were offered like the tea they picked as another imperial commodity. And these images of demure, appealing, domesticated brown women celebrated the plantation system um, while reinforcing an image of South Asian sensuality that I think still continues to frame representations of uh, South Asian femininity, um, womanhood, and of course, tourist images of the island. So unlike Australia's sugar industry, the tea industry and its workers have a highly visible presence in the history and economics of Sri Lanka, but these narratives really um, work to silence that the harsh physical conditions and economic inequalities facing these laborers and their families. So Hanusha was born on a tea plantation um, in Hatton, which is sort of in the middle of Sri Lanka. And she uses the instruments of tea drinking to quite literally link blood and labor, while also paying homage to the labor of her parents and grandparents, her mother and grandmother, you know, whose wages paid for her education. So this is stain two, which um, as you can see, she's drawn, uh, she's drawn images in ink and then glazed them on tea, on teacups. Um, they show different scenes from plantation life. There's a pregnant woman, there's a, um, there's a creche window here um, with saris hanging down to cradle the sleeping children while their parent, their mothers work. There's a woman surrounded by tea leaves and wage slips. She's also included a um, little a tea bag label next to each image. So with this in this one, which is um, the scene of the pregnant woman, the label says, "Pregnant woman, labor, risk, income," and then ends with the question, "Why?" Extending this evocation of physicality, she also writes and draws on tea strainers so that the act of pouring tea can literally bring to light the bodies of the tea pickers and the conditions they face. And in silent struggle, she uses wage slips um, as architectural plans of the plantation to highlight the imbalance between the value of labor and the production of profit. A reminder, as with um, Jasmine's work, Bittersweet, of the racial capitalism that sustains natural his national histories at the cost of material lives. Hanusha explained in an interview, I quote, our tea everyone knows, but when they drink their tea, 
They do not know who makes it. And yet here she is. The taste of Ceylon tea is not human, end quote. Um, so finally, I just want to um, kind of wrap up by saying both these women use their artwork as forms of witness and they willfully activate familial memories to destabilize the official record. Uh, they remind us just how much representation matters in the valuation or eradication of life. We can't move into the future without knowing our past, says Jasmine. And here in another series um, called The Past is Ahead, Don't Look Back, Jasmine uses the, a collodion process to emulate 19th century photographic practices to allow her to literally step into the archive. In this uh, act of animation, she's producing a space of coexistence where she can stand with her ancestors, where she can stand with the ones she has lost. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, I am, I am just, as, as I mentioned, disheartened by all of the research and, and the work of uh, new names for me, um, artists that I am unfamiliar with, and I'm looking forward to learning more about the artwork. And um, finally, we will have uh, Cheryl Finley. And Cheryl will, uh, we have a number of questions, I am assuming. And Cheryl will um, begin with uh, the questions for our panelists. We have about 25 minutes. And so I thank all of you and looking forward to listening to the responses. Cheryl? You're on remote, uh -huh. right. <laughs> thank you. Great, hello, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to begin by thanking um, Maza, Sade, uh, Anna, and Ifra for sharing your work. Um, and, and I just wanted to start, we do have one question that I see in the queue and I would like to just ask everyone who's joining us today to please um, uh, submit your questions through the Q&A function so that we can try to get to them uh, today. I'd like to try to, um, draw some connections between your, your, your work today, your presentations today. And, and I want to just echo um, uh, Lisa and Deb and Ellen um, and all of us in the Women and Migrations Working Group um, about this, this important global conversation that we're having. And I think that the work that was shared with us today will give you a sense of how pressing the need is to continue to have this conversation um, in this platform, across continents, um, across different kinds of disciplines. Um, this is truly an interdisciplinary conversation that we're having, um, that we have contributions in literature, poetry, performance, art history, um, material culture, through different media, photography, uh, 3D installation, um, and also through intervention as well. Um, this is one of the ways that this conversation about women and migration and its relationship to our very lives and existence today and forging the path forward, as Lisa um, suggested, that we are at the forefront of doing that, um, but also thinking through the histories that you have shared through your archival work um, and also through even giving um, a sensorial dimension to what migration um, means, what it, what it can be, and how we go through our archival work and discover things. Um, Maza, you shared with us uh, the album that you have written about um, so, so eloquently, the, the album um, that has those images in it that you said you had to open it and then close it immediately. Um, the way that you were able to um, piece together a history through mapping and kind of trying to, um, in a way, um, look at migration, migration through um, the imagination. You said uh, something about how um, the imagination itself migrates. Um, and that was a phrase that really, really struck with me. Uh, not only struck me, and, and not only to think about uh, the way that sort of the spatial organization um, of the uh, execution camps that you were able to find is something that suggests, uh, suggests migration, but also mapping those images in the album to them and also thinking about how there's this uh, counter archive and also conversation that's going on as well. But again, to 
think about that phrase, how, how the imagination itself is something that, that migrates. And then Ifra, when you spoke with us um, and read to us about um, your, your poem, um, Refugee Without Lands, um, and your poem that talks about the nature of forced migration, um, and also this, this uh, need and of the you know, US government in particular, um, but I would say other governments as well um, uh, across the pond, uh, especially if we wanna talk about the migration crisis um, in and around the Mediterranean, which is one of the places that really brought us to, together as a group, um, that these settler colonies are, are places that we, we also need to think about um, what happens there and what kinds of connections um, are formed uh, there um, out of certain kinds of needs. But the thing that struck with me the most about um, your, your poem, and, and I, I, I can't wait to listen to the recording again, is the way in which your poem really brought about um, this uh, dimension that had to do with taste and sound and you setting up the sense of, of how do we um, imagine home, how do we recreate home um, in these new spaces um, when we're set in even these settler colonies um, to talk about the sonic notion um, and also the way that speaking um, is something that of course is affected, our language is affected. Speaking of your, your mother, um, and you asked the question, many questions, but one in particular, what if the foreign is familiar and the familiar is foreign? Um, how one is forced to lose one's own tongue in order to uh, conform. Um, and today, um, in, in your work, um, naming and calling out uh, violence, especially a uh, violence against trans black women um, in your installations, in your light sculptures, and also thinking about how performance is something that you use as an artist um, and helping us to think about, again, the aggression and the, the violent nature um, of these killings um, that you have uh, memorialized in your work through the body and through performance, through speaking out, so that here we have a dimension that goes beyond just 3D, but also incorporates as well the sonic, so that we can hear these names again and again. And even in the clip that you showed to us um, from uh, your work at the Venice Biennale at the opening and at, at the end uh, with Farca Nostra, and really trying to, um, in that work, memorialize the loss of over 1,200 lives, um, how that performance piece is something that's audible too. It's not just your voice that's spoken, but it's also the voices of the people who are trying to prevent you from your, from your memorial work, from the intervention that you're performing. So here, I'm, I'm trying to pull threads together that also relate to um, not just state-sanctioned violence, but also the way in which we are kept from or kept down uh, from trying to, to do our work. And then Anna, um, in your work on the legacies of indentureship, especially focusing on, on, on um, artists who are addressing uh, Southeast Asia um, and, and Sri, Sri Lanka in, in particular, um, I was really, really uh, taken by the way in which um, the use of the material and the archival um, was brought into not just your presentation, but also in the two artists, as Deb was saying, um, these are artists that uh, many of us are probably not that familiar with, but to think about how they have pulled in um, the archive, how they've thought about something um, like tea or sugar, um, something that's very much a part of so many people's lives, um, and how we can, again, uh, grapple with um, memory and photography, um, and also this compounded racial capitalism that we're still trying to dismantle um, today. So I just want to, in those words, try to bring together some of the some of the presentations, and now I'm going to switch over to uh, the questions to see what uh, they have um, uh, lined up in, in the queue. So um, the first question is from Chanel, Chanel uh, Pulido, um, and this question is, how do you find the courage to speak up, perform when others confront and disagree with you? And that could be to anyone. Anyone who would like to take that? You're on, uh, unmute, unmute. Today? You're okay. all, yeah. <laughs> um, it, the question is, how do you find the courage to, what courage yeah. you? How do you, uh, how, how do you find the courage to speak up, to perform when others confront and disagree with you? Um, 
I, I don't know. I just, I, I've been performing for many years now. Um, I think, and I've made a lot of bad performances. <laughs> and I've, made, um, I've also done, I guess, what other people would consider really embarrassing things in front of large groups of people and in public spaces. So I think that I've worked that muscle quite a bit. Um, but also, I mean, I think spiritually I'm grounded in certain ways that I, I've, I feel that I'm, I'm protected, but also I, I make sure that there's other people around me that I know. I will say that the November performance was worrisome because not so much for myself, but I was thinking about my friend, Doug Maui, who he was ride or die about it, but I personally didn't want to put him in a position because he actually lives in Italy. Um, I know that my US passport would get me out if something really went down, um, but, I don't know. I think it's like, for me, I think it's just been years of like, not giving a shit, to be honest. Um, and, and I've, I also have a very rebellious spirit. So um, anytime authority tries to check me, I kind of <laughs> don't, I don't listen. If anything, it fuels my fat fire to just be like, nah, we're, we're no, we're on the same level. You're not better than me. What about Mazo? <laughs> Mazo or Efra, you're, yeah, what about the two of you? You know, I, um, I, I can, let me, Tom, Tom just sent me a, a, a question, which is in a sense of a pushback, speaking of, you know, what happens when people disagree. And the message just says, uh, the question for me, for this panel, uh, said there's a photo album titled Africa, Ethiopia, uh, Libya, Abyssinia, Donne, Arabe, uh, showing only a few partially nude women out of many, many photos of women. This seems to contradict the characterization of East African women that Maza Mengiste stated in her talk. Um, and I think one of the things that uh, this happens when women speak of something that makes other people uncomfortable. Um, and the one way that <laughs> And uh, the one way that I make sure my act of rebellion is researching so well that any of these things I know I can shut down and, and um, respond to quite well, which is, you know, I know what I'm talking about. And one album that somebody else has seen does not negate the years of research that I have done. Um, so that, that this is also another subtle way you get the pushback from that policeman in quite an overt way. Um, but I think there are other there are other ways we are taught to to watch our place, watch our face, watch our mouth. Um, we do the work, and then we come forward, and and you stick by it. Okay. And I, I think one of the things that I would like to add to that, thank you so much, Maza and Sade, um, is is a statement that that Anna made, and also something that I observed in in each of your presentations. It's it's in terms of the type of work that you do that pushbacks, that continually pushbacks, pushes back, excuse me, um, and displaces is work that has to do with really trying to dismantle the official narratives, right? So that if you're doing your archival research or if you are doing uh, a performance, um, the Barca Nostra performance today um, where um, this is something that no one um, is, is expecting. You are infusing that moment or you're infusing the historical album or the historical narrative with the personal in such a way that you're creating and offering a, a different dimension to, to what's been already on the books for such a long period of time. And that disruption, I think, is something that people are very, very, and should be uncomfortable with. But that's, a, that's another way of really um, getting at how we can foment change um, in this arena, um, but really trying to kind of insert these narratives that, that people don't know about, that they've not done the research that you've done, Maza, in order to know about them, to be able to speak officially about them. Um, the pushback that I often get is really when I'm researching and uh, working with refugee communities and picking topics and ways of, you know, thinking about migration that uh, oftentimes, as Cheryl said, it's not the, the narrative, it's not what the questions that tend to be asked. And so for me, I come from uh, a tradition, I'm Muslim, 
I believe that, you know, I only answer to God. And so for me, I feel protected. And I come from a strong African woman. And I've always been taught to speak my mind and to not necessarily um, speak to those who are already, um, you know, seeing me as less than. I speak to those people, my audience, even though right and academically, it's the community. Um, and so I, I feel I feel protected and I, I don't necessarily have to appease or speak in a way or be a certain way that um, is the norm for certain spaces. And I think we, we all know what that feels like, um, but I feel mm -hmm. protected. Estro, can I intervene a second? Um, there's a question um, that Anna, the, there's a question that Anna, you can answer in the same vein of answering this, this question. Um, so if you can combine the two. Um, it says in research where you're able to, where you're able to find artwork from non-dominant culture, um, where where is the archive from Sri Lanka, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Haiti? Uh, but in terms of this is also part of that question of pushback. So if you can do both. Well, um, sorry, your your answers were really inspiring. Thank you. Um, in terms of archives, the way I tend to do my work, precisely because we don't have a lot of official archives from, you know, uh, black people from colonized South South Asians, um, is through the work that artists do. Um, and so, the, for example, Hanusha, who is a, a, a Tamil woman born on a tea plantation, faces continually still faces a lot of uh, ethnic and caste discrimination because of her her status in Sri Lanka. You know, she her work sort of helps me to look back at these archives and thread other stories out of them. Um, and I think that that's for me how how I'm able to keep doing the work I do um, because I have I'm working with artists. I'm working with um, communities who who are actively I mean Jasmine's the same she she does has, has a similar process um, mm -hmm. and so I, I think working with artists in this way has given me a model for my academic research and teaching but also just continually sustains me as do people like Cheryl and Deb and you know the, the women that I'm here so I think for me it's research is also a form of community building in that sense Absolutely. Thank you so much for that answer, Anna. Um, it really is. This is very much a part of a community building project altogether. Um, I'd like to now address a question by Marzian Alam. And this question is, how can we effectively talk about the unique position of contemporary immigrant women as both settlers and colonized? How can we craft our narratives in a way that honors indigeneity hours from our homeland and that of First Nations people? Yes, sure. I think, thank, um, you. thank you for that question. Um, as I stated before I, I read my poem, I think it's important for first and foremost for us to acknowledge the truth, uh, to acknowledge that, you know, and this is speaking to, you know, um, the American context, because I'm sure many of our attendees are calling in from all over the world. Um, I think it's important for us to acknowledge, but to go beyond that acknowledgement, to seek out and to build with people who are indigenous for First Nation people. Um, I think that for a lot of us who come here as refugees, the narrative is oftentimes, um, you know, the wider sort of neoliberal narrative is that we're coming in, we're you know, we're going to be in a peaceful country and, you know, like let refugees in, but people are not understanding how, in fact, some of those discussions and discourses tend to erase, you know, as your, as your question um, highlights, and as I stated earlier, the narrative of Indigenous people, and as well as African Americans who have been um, part of, of, of the building and structure and, and making this country what it is today. And so for me, you know, making sure that my work and the work that I do in the community is not just with refugees, but also figuring out ways that I build with people who are also in similar, you know, who are doing similar work, but perhaps come from different backgrounds or, you know, 
the struggle is a struggle. We all have a struggle, but I think centering those voices and centering those narratives and not making, you know, our, and I'm speaking about refugees, sort of be the narrative, right? I mean, you see now what's happening in Minneapolis and, you know, there are people who are protesting and, and standing up for the rights of, the human rights of Black people, right? This is not just a civil rights thing as, as Malcolm X reminded us time and time again. But I think for to see the young Somalis and to see the old elderly Somali women also standing up and saying that enough is enough, to me, that is how we show up. This is how we build with people. And this is how we, you know, present a different narrative from the one that, you know, neoliberal white moderate America tried to present to us. And so more than acknowledgement, I think really building with people and standing with people is, is the way forward. Thank you, Ifra. Um, I'd like to now pause just for a moment. We do have a few more questions in the queue, but I, I did want to ask each of you, did you want to entertain any questions between, between yourselves or any other conversation, but just between the four of you or the nice, I can't do the addition, the seven of us, <laughs> eight of us here. I'll Ellen. ask uh, Maza a question that I, that, we've discussed before, but um, about the reception of your work in Italy. I mean, you were able to find so many photographs and create, I think you have an archive of photographs that is um, published somewhere, maybe you can tell us, um, that all of these photographs were preserved and cared for by people um, in their families. And yet there was a kind of distinct lack of um, recognition of uh, Italy's colonial history. So what is the reception of your work and you in Italy? Because I know you spend a good deal of time there. Yeah, yeah, well, you've been on some of the research trips with me. Um, so, I, you know, I've gone to flea markets where everything has been during the research. You know, the, there are two kinds of reactions I would get. It's either, let me help you, what, what are you looking for? Or get out of here. You don't belong here. So I've had those two things during research, whether it's in, in the libraries or in, in flea markets. Um, since the book has been published, uh, I went to Rome uh, right early on. The book will be translated. It's being translated in Italian. It's going to be published in the spring. Maza, um, would you please remind us of the title of your book? Oh, Sorry, yeah, The Shadow King. So The Shadow King is, was released in September in the, in the United States, and it will be released in spring of 2021 in Italy. And uh, I went to Rome in December mm -hmm. of this Thank past year. Um, oh, that's so sweet. Um, to uh, get an award uh, in Rome, an Italian award for the book to help with its publication and to help with its translation. In that award ceremony, I, the judges all spoke about why they liked the book. Um, I went up to accept it, said my thank you, sat down, and somebody stood up in the back. And this was at the American Academy. And someone stood up in the back and basically just said, the history was really not that bad. <laughs> and so it was one person, they, they, they were in the wrong company that night. This was not the group, you know, so everybody was standing up. The judges were in an uproar. Um, and I, you know, I turned around and this guy was very quiet, very polite, was very insistent though. Uh, so I think it'll be interesting to see the kind of response the book gets when it's fully translated. But the other reactions I've had from the descendants of soldiers in Ethiopia, it has been uh, mostly discomfort and, and a lot of guilt, and they don't know enough because no one ever talked about it in their family. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So I'd like to read a comment uh, from someone named Sandra. Uh, who says, uh, thank you for recognizing Native and Black women, because most people don't think we still exist. We are also looked at as, in, as immigrants many times. 
So I just wanted to share that comment with, with you all from Sandra. I'm going to move on to a question from Amy Mooney uh, at, from Columbia uh, University, I think, uh, who uh, says, many thanks to the panelists and organizers, such incredible and impressive work. One of the things that the presenters have in common is the necessity of decentering the, quote, official narratives. Might one or all of the contributors further address these strategies, especially as acts of resistance and the necessity of drawing upon the personal as political. And I'll just make a really quick comment um, about that. And my, my, my first take on that is that um, it's not really a strategy. It's a way of existence for me. Uh, it's, not a, it's not an effort to center myself and people who look like me in my world or in the world because it's the way I exist. So I, would, I wouldn't even think of it as some kind of strategy or necessity. It's just a way of existing. Uh, it just is. And I find it, I think other people need to accommodate that. Thank you. That's a great answer. Anyone else want to add to that? Um, I'll just add. Because I was, th I was thinking about the, uh, today, um, so let me close my question so I can see everyone again. Um, I was thinking about uh, your answer to uh, one of the very first questions and talking about, you know, the, the, the idea of pushing back, um, you know, and, and how does one deal with the, the so-called pushback. I think it's, it's having that you know, it's, it's, it's in your body, it's in your soul, it's in, it's in, it's in what we have to do, right? But you, you can't have someone speak to you in a certain way or treat you a certain way and just walk past it as if it's, as if it's okay. Can I just say one quickly, um, just in, in relation to, the, to Jasmine's work particularly, I think it's also about finding a new language because you can't use the, you know, to quote Audre Lorde, you can't use the master's tools to dismantle the master's house, right? And so if you don't have a, an official record, if you don't have a public narrative that um, incorporates you, where, where do you find that language from? And it has to be from alternative, you know, radically alternative sources right. yourself, essentially, yeah. Thank you. And so, so on that, that point, Anna, and thank you so much for, for offering that and also raising up the, the name and the memory and the really important work of Audre Lorde. Um, I'm also thinking about the, the program that I lead um, at the Atlanta University Center and the students that I work with who are all um, undergraduate students. And one of the things that we're really trying to do um, at, in the work that we do in teaching art history and curatorial studies is to do it differently, is to really not, you know, again, as, as um, uh, Lisa Coleman uh, pointed out in the very beginning that we're, we're not going to go back to, you know, a new normal or we don't know what it is, but we're going to be leading what, what that is. Um, and so I wanted to ask each of you if you, if you could say something to um, the undergraduate students who might be with us today, um, if you could say something about the work that you do um, as writers, as poets, um, as uh, activists, as art historians, as performance artists. Um, if there's something that you might share with, uh, with students, there are some questions that come from students who are artists themselves, who are also trying to find a way um, with their work and also using um, their work that relates to their own personal experience. But if you could please share something with our students, that'd be wonderful. So just a reminder, we have about eight minutes left, okay? Okay, I'll go briefly, quickly. Um, I always try to remind my students, um, I teach a silver school of social work at NYU and these are social work students that, um, you know, really come to be servants, to serve uh, communities, oftentimes um, disadvantaged communities. And one thing that I always try to leave them with is, you know, critical self-reflection is a lifelong process. And, you know, before trying to dismantle any system, we have to first and foremost look within ourselves and see what do we need to work on internally. Oftentimes, you know, we're all pressured to like act or react, and there's very little self-reflection that happens. So my, my very few remarks here would be to, you know, engage in critical self-reflection with yourself first and foremost, 
you know, we all come with our strengths and limitations and find out where you can serve, how can you serve and read, read as much as you can and read, you know, the work of people that you're trying to help. Let the expert, their voices be the voices that you see as experts. Um, so read black women, you know, read the work of black women, black artists. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of, a lot of the, um, you know, students have, and I've even gotten an email from one of my students who's like, I want to know what can I do? And, you know, it really, that, that critical self-reflection and that internal work and the work that you do on your own is very much important. And that will prepare you to come into the classroom and to be open to learning and accepting, you know, knowledge from people that look like me and, and my co-panelists. So um, lifelong, pro you know, it's a lifelong process, that, you know, and, and I hope that you all are able to engage in that this summer. I can quickly add that if there's any artists that are your students, um, I would say find a mentor um, as soon as possible that is older than you, who's been in the game longer. That's really helped me. I have various mentors um, across different mediums. Um, that's one. The other is something that my friends and I always discuss that I regularly collaborate with is reach across to, to support and pull up people, reach down. Um, I know that the art world, people tend to be really obsessed with like reaching and, you know, the term clout chasing, like that, that doesn't help. Like reach across and reach below you um, and pull people up, pull the people that are beside you up with you. Um, the other thing I would say is as simple as it sounds, don't give up. I mean, I know everybody says that, but like there have been so many times I've wanted to quit art. Like I probably did last week, <laughs> you know? Um, I'm also a mother doing this. So any of you who are parents or who become parents, this is possible. And I'm specifically talking to mothers because um, there's lots of fathers out there who have wonderful wives who are supporting their art careers. Um, we need, yeah, we need more mothers in this work. Um, but yeah, it's possible. I've had a difficult journey, but I'm still here and I'm still showing up every day. And this is a priority to me. No one, including my son, will stop me from, from being an artist. So. I think everyone, it's, I would say the same thing, exactly what you two said. Okay. Um, um, so we have, I, I saw a note from, from uh, Tom saying maybe this should be the last question. Do we have about six more minutes to entertain more questions? Or four. Do we have a four minutes. Okay. Um, so one of the questions that I'm going to ask, this is from an anonymous attendee um, for anyone. What questions around ethics in your practice did you have to answer before beginning your work, especially those that have a participatory practice? Can, can you also answer, I was trying to text you because I can't, my text is not working. Um, Mark Williams asked a question about the tea pickers. And um, if you yes. can also answer yes. that. In, um, okay. Uh, so, so Mark Williams' question is following professor, um, uh, um, pr following uh, Maza's lead and the use of the word camouflage, the necessity of using a woman's body to seduce away from the violence of the colonizer, double, triple, quadruple violence. The lyric of the Italian song at the bi biennial, Tamil tea pickers, quote, demure, demure domesticated brown women concurrent with South, South Asian sensuality, end quote. Often think of how agency within the academy, the American cultural studies is an attempt to be precisely that, to illuminate that can be so reductive at the same time as it misses the implicit pre-existing agency and gaze upon the gaze. I'll repeat that, the gaze upon the gaze, specifically how the artist is the migrant themselves located therein. I think that's a great statement. Yeah. You know, because you, you know, I don't think there's an answer to it, but I, I totally agree and love the idea of the gaze, of the artist's gaze and that sense of reflection. And then if you want to, do the last question. Cheryl, I'll repeat that last question again. This is, this is around ethics in your practice. Um, uh, did you have to answer any questions about ethics in your practice before beginning your work, especially those who are doing um, uh, performance-related work? Yes, I'll chime in. Um, 
Well, so I usually, um, especially the participatory part, I either give people a heads up um, before I do it. Um, again, because I've been doing this for quite some time, I can now sense when somebody is open to particip participating. And obviously if they don't want to, I, I don't include them. Um, but I usually um, bring in people that already know me or know the work, are willing to be a part of it. Um, and like, or I can just like sense like this person is open to, to joining in to the performance. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Cheryl, do you think? <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. Okay. I, I have another question from Paulette Young. Um, and that is a question uh, for speakers to talk about how they're expanding their projects on women and migration and or where they see their work going in the future. And we've got about two minutes, so uh, if someone could maybe just uh, give a sense of where you're going with your work in the future. I'll just say, Clay, I'm, um, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Anna. Oh, sorry. I just, I'm, I'm working on a new book called The Global Plantation, and there'll be a seminar, a symposium open to everybody in October. So I hope you'll join. All right. That's great. As we close uh, quickly, um, we will preserve the questions that are in the Q&A and um, look for answers from the participants um, that we'll probably post on one of the websites or all of the websites um, that are created around this project. And if there are more questions, um, there in the initial invitation, there was a place to send them in. We'd love to hear from- Well, there was a comment from Sarah Khan. I'd like to- I'd like to read Sarah Khan's comment. And it's just, it disappeared. She wrote, I am appreciative of all the women and migration colleagues who create work that inspire and provide courage and creativity for us all to continue our respective rebellion everywhere. Thank you. <laughs> it's a beautiful way to close. Thank you, yes. Sarah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you to everyone. A wonderful way to close and a wonderful way to begin in this discussion. So we thank you all. We hope to see we'll everyone next Wednesday, same time. Same time, same place. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.